nervous is going to be talking about details of Python. And then I was terribly reprimanded um, for butchering um, Jan Karl Brandt's name because I call him Jan Karl Brand. Um, but he's talking in the Caspian venue uh, on introduction to Plone content management system. Um, so yeah, please make your way across downstairs or hang around here for Mache. Mache, thank you very much. Hey, does it work? Uh, so, who am I? Uh, I'm Maciej Fiokowski. Yes, this is a Unicode letter here. And uh, it's kind of hard to get, I understand that. Uh, I'm PyPy core developer for as long as I, as I remember, essentially. So it was like something like 2005 or 2006, I started as a student uh, doing Google Summer of Code. By the way, fabulous pro program. If you're a student, you should really apply and do something cool this summer. Uh, this summer, which is winter. Uh, and then I'm also a performance freak. So I'll talk a bit about performance and how this fits together in PyPy. I would suggest people move slightly closer because there are many places and I will be showing demos on small fonts if somebody wants to see. So what is this talk about? I'll talk about Python performance or lack of it, depends how you look look at the problem. Uh, why why does it matter? A lot of people keep saying, uh, you shouldn't choose Python if you need performance. So my point is that it should not matter. You should choose the programming language you want to use and then it should just work for you. It should be somebody else's problem like mine to make sure it actually works fast. Uh, and what we can do about it, how, how, we can, how we can still use Python a bit everywhere without worrying that it's going to be too slow or we'll have to rewrite stuff in C or something like that. Then the problem I figure out is I can tell you various things about how PyPy works, but without understanding exactly how it works, it's kind of hard to predict its performance. So I'll talk about how a bit about how PyPy works depending how time permits. So let me quote Guido. Avoid over-engineering data structure. Tuples are better than objects. Try name tuple tooth though. Prefer simple fields over getter setter functions. Building data types are your friends. Use more numbers, strings, tuples, lists, sets, decks. Also check out the collections library, especially deck you. Be suspicious of function method calls. Creating a stack frame is expensive. The universal speedup is rewriting small bits of code in C. Do this only when all else fails. Uh, this talk is about disagreeing with all those statements, essentially. I strongly disagree with the fact, like, to paraphrase, don't use abstractions, don't use Python. This is essentially what this, I if you care about performance, like, otherwise you're fine. But if you care about performance, don't do this. And this is not something I really want to do. I want my software to use abstractions. I want my software to be able to like do things despite the fact that there's maybe a single line function that I put somewhere else and now suddenly it's slower because I have to create a frame. No, I don't want that. But also, and this is part of the where I really agree with Guido, measure. If you... Modern computers are very, very complex and there are many moving parts so you cannot really predict your performance unless you have benchmarks. But this also means that if you have no benchmarks, you don't care. If you never bothered writing benchmarks, your performance does not matter. This is a very, very important point. You can only care about performance if you have benchmarks. If you say, I don't want to write benchmarks right now, I have other stuff to do, it means you don't care about performance, which is fine. But don't try to optimize. So, as I said, I like my abstractions, I really like Python, I would like to not never ever rewrite stuff for performance, especially in stuff like C, and especially in stuff like C Python C API, which is completely atrocious and I can never get it right. I can never like get the ref count exactly right and neither leaks memory or sec falls, I'm just too dumb to do that. And so I really like Python, Python is a very good language, I would like to use it for pretty much everything I write. Uh, I also like assembler, but this is my small pet stuff. Uh, 
And I don't want to rewrite stuff in C, C++. This, this is the point. I can rewrite my software in different sort of Python that performs better. But I don't want to rewrite in C. I w still want to use high level languages. So th this, this was kind of ideal. So okay, let's do second best. Second best guess is I still keep my abstractions. But I have to do some arcane voodoo to make it fast. So use this, not that despite the fact that it looks the same or do something da like some tribal dances around your code and then suddenly performs better that's okay that's still better than trying to rewrite stuff in C in my opinion uh, the problem is you have to understand voodoo in order to to do anything because well just doing shotgun debugging is not giving you anything you have to kind of understand how the how the stuff works so well, I'll show you. This is uh, ooh, what's that? So this is the go away. This is my test running, I think. This is Guido, and this is actual his his quote. So I can show you his picture. Yes, this is Guido who said that. I didn't make this up. Just wanted to make sure. So the first thing to remember before we move on is that there is no such thing as language performance. Language might be easier or harder to optimize, depends how much effort you put into it. But there is no such thing as language is slow or language is fast. It's always it's always this particular implementation is slow, this particular implementation is fast. I can come up with a very very slow C compiler. I'm I'm sure a lot of people can. It, it's not that hard. So there is no such thing as language performance. There is. It might be indeed much harder to optimize Python than C, but there is no proof that you cannot run Python program as fast as C or faster or Fortran or any other language like this. So I'll talk mostly about PyPy performance for the reason that C Python performance is relatively straightforward, which is not completely straightforward, but CPython essentially executes stuff in the interpreter one thing after another. So you can measure one thing and then add all the things you do and you'll end up with a total time as a good first approximation. This is kind of boring, but PyPy is completely not like this. PyPy analyzes your program as a bit a b bigger chunk. So this, I will skip the CPython performance characteristics and talk a bit about PyPy and how it actually works. Also, I know better. So what is PyPy essentially? Armin already talked about it a bit. Uh, this is the part that we really care about today. So Python, PyPy is a Python interpreter. Uh, but it's also a toolchain for creating dynamic language implementations. I think the worst thing that we did so far was to name this thing PyPy and this thing PyPy makes PyPy name not very unique, uh, and people get incredibly confused. Yeah, you wait, wait, wait a second. So you write Python in Python, and then you compile it to Assembler. How does it actually work? So those are two things. We would like to split this thing and move it away and call it something else, like our Python. Uh, PyPy is a Python interpreter. It has some special characteristics, and for for completion, I will say that it's also an open source project that has been around for almost 10 years. It started in 2003, uh, so it's getting to maturity, I guess, in terms of open source project uh, lifespan. So a few words about compilers versus interpreters, how it actually works. Uh, how many people have ever written a compiler on their studies, for example, like even a simple one? Quite a few. Yes, I know you did, Armin. <laughs> uh, so compiler takes a, generally the idea is that you take a high level language like C or Python or assembler that contains uh, mnemonics and not just bytes and compile it to a slightly lower level language it, it really depends what you what your goal is today but one the the end product is usually assembler. So, uh, for example, there is a compiler called Stalin, which is a scheme compiler that compiles 
compiles for very very long compile scheme to C and then you take GCC and compile this C to assembler and then assembler to actually bytes that processor can understand then there are more layers where processor rewrites the assembler from one standard to another and something else that's confidential uh, so compiler takes and reduces the abstraction of the language so you and primarily you can write compiler for any language so you can take a compiler of language X and compile it to a lower level language Y ideally it would be assembler but you can also use intermediate steps interpreter is something else interpreter is a program written in a lower level language that typically it's not a given but typically you will take a language compile it to some sort of bytecode so for example why can anybody see here it's kind of small isn't it Boom. Hmm? Oh. Okay, it's like that. If you take uh, Python, Python, and you define a function, function returns one, for example. There's a special module called this, and if you disassemble the function, it's an incredibly boring function. So this function. Uh, This function loads a constant from pre-built constants that each code has. Constant 1 in this, th this example and then returns value. So those are two byte codes. Then if you have a slightly more complicated function like this. Then load fast means, means it's faster than the normal load. Uh, uh, it, it's true like it was introduced because there was a load name I think and then at some point said oh but we can optimize this and introduce a new bytecode so it'll code load fast uh, it's not actually this fast but it's faster so you load the first variable uh, at index 0 that's called A you load the second variable at index 1 that's called B and what does it mean load it means you take the variable from somewhere where it is and you put it from the list of local variables and you put it on the stack this is a stack machine uh, then binary add is a funny thing because it's a binary operation that has no arguments what it means it means that it takes one element from the stack the other element from the stack appends them uh, adds them and puts the result back on the stack and then return value means that uh, you take the last value from the stack and you return it from the function I think if we look at the, how the actual code looks like, it looks like this. So this is the binary representation of the this code. This is just for explanations. So we have an interpreter, and I wrote uh, specifically for the purpose of this talk an interpreter. So. So this has quite a few bytecodes. It has, for the simplicity, I named the bytecodes exactly the same as Python. So, so this is uh, load fast, load const. We've seen this already. Comparison just compares two two operands. Uh, pop jump if false is a merge of pop one thing from the stack and then jump if uh, if it was false add is add and then store fast stores back the value from the stack to local list and jump absolute just jump so it's enough to express a loop now how the interpreter looks like the interpreter looks like this so you read the this is a list of all bytecodes that you have to interpret and you uh, you check what's it, if it has an argument, you read the argument then next from the list of values and then you dispatch the bytecode. So this is kind of kind of boring, but this is how the C Python or PyPy interpreter actually looks inside. 
it will have this giant loop that will do things depending of what uh, what bytecode has. So the problem compared to compiler is that compiler doesn't have that. If we if we compile Python, it, instead of having this loop, the end result will look like this. Let's say we compile a function like this. So the uh, the function will compile to load fast a b and return value. So this is exactly if we compiled Python like naively, it would actually take the values from the opcodes and compile them in one chunk of code. That would look like this. Uh, so load fast does this. We hop hop the other one and then stack append stack pop. Uh, we pop right first. Pop. Pop. I remove. And this is actually like code that would be compiled. This is this is relatively important because this is the only difference between compiler and interpreter. The compiler will just glue them together. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. I think so. Uh, so this is the only difference between interpreter and compiler, like naively speaking. The interpreter will have a byte called dispatch loop and the compiler will not. The compiler will glue them together and just execute them. So you in terms of performance you have you have the there's a difference and the difference is you don't do not have the bytecode dispatch loop. End of differences. Like naive compiler will do exactly that. From our perspective, like from our measurements, it seems that Knife compiler is not even twice faster than the interpreter in terms of Python. Because, for example, this code becomes big and then you start missing caches and whatnot. So you, you don't get any other effects by doing a compilation compared to interpretation. You just get rid of bytecode dispatch loop. Now, to do anything here that's more interesting, you would need to know what the left is. Because if the left is an integer, then you can remove the add because you know what, what function is this. However, you need to know what, what things come here. And in Python, it's incredibly hard to determine. So instead, PyPy has a hybrid approach called just-in-time uh, compile compilation, which is we have an interpreter that we wrote. It looks very much, it, no, it doesn't look like this, but it could look like this. And the hot paths are compiled directly to assembler. And why, why, why? Why go through all of this if we can just write a compiler? That's precisely because if we do that, we can determine at runtime what are the values of uh, various types. So we can do much more optimizations than we just did a simple compiler. And this is this is essentially the point of why we do just-in-time compilation. So just-in-time compilation is has been there around for like 30 years or 20 years. I don't know. It's quite old. However, the, there are a few flavors and became popular recently. So uh, we have V8, for example, that's a Chrome JavaScript engine. And this one doesn't have an interpreter at all. It just have a JIT compiler. It has actually two. Uh, then there is TraceMonkey for or flavor of the day of SpiderMonkey for Firefox. They have like four or five. I don't know. Uh, and th there is quite a bunch. Like JVM has JIT compilation. Uh, .NET has JIT compilation, so it became popular relatively recently. And the, the common denominator is that it observes runtime values. So because you observe runtime values, you can specialize the code very aggressively. But also, the point is you don't need to, ch to follow all the paths. Because 
static compiler has to prove certain things exist. In Python, there are very unlikely cases where like sys get frame. Somebody can call sys get frame. It's a very unlikely case. Most people don't call sys get frame, but some people do. Like the debugger will call sys get frame. And this means that you have a very unlikely case that will deoptimize everything. When we have JIT compilation, we can be kind of optimistic about what's going on and then bail out if it doesn't go back to the interpreter. So it, it's a different strategy. So PyPy JIT is kind of special because it observes the interpreter. So we didn't write a JIT for Python. We wrote a JIT that observes the interpreter. So as we see, it can observe any interpreter like this one. It will go around and like record what happened and then when it knows what happened it will compile the assembler. And then so, so uh, the major benefit of this is we Yes, we wrote this very complex tool here, but we have an interpreter there and we can change the interpreter without changing this very complex tool. And this lets us operate at the, I think our manpower is like a tenth of V8 manpower. So we have like, we must automate more than they do essentially, otherwise it's impossible for us to compete. Uh, so it primarily compiles loops. So if you have a loop, it will detect that you have a loop and then compile the loop to assembler. So the basic property that's often uh, misjudged is that the speed changes over time because it will start interpreting slow and then it will ever anybody who uses Java will know that things warm up a bit. So hopefully it changes from slow to fast. It's not always true, but most of the time it's true. Sometimes it changes from fast to slower. Uh, or more often from slow to really slow if, if you really hit the bad case uh, so, but it means that if you benchmark you need to warm up things before they get hot so you kind of re need to run one benchmarks a few times before you can actually observe the times integers, everybody loves adding integers in Python so I have this complex Python program that add some integers. It's very, very fast. And I run it with a mystic command line option. Think, think, think. And I have a So this is the function, think, think, think. Uh, those are Python opcodes, so it starts with load fast i and then load cons and then comparison. And then this is actual integer operations on the processor. So you end up with very few operations on the processor. To, for comparison, if you run the same thing in the interpreter, you end up going like thousands of operations. And this is the this is actually checking if 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 you didn't press Control C, so checking for signals. So this is how it compiled. So we have Python opcodes, and then inside you have the integer operations that per are performed on the actual processor. So abstractions, how do we get rid of abstractions? Abstractions are there are things like inlining, so a small functions will be inlined into upper functions. So you don't pay for creation of the frames or anything like this. And the point is abstractions are cheap if they don't introduce too much complexity. You cannot write Eclipse and hope it will be cheap. JVM is an incredibly good VM, but if you write Eclipse, it will be slow just because there's like megabytes and megabytes of code to load to start with and then warm up and then do, do many things. So yes, abstractions are okay, but keep them lean for re readability reasons mostly. So the goal is to try and 
do things the way you would explain stuff to a person. So if the code is simple, the JIT will probably understand the code also pretty well. If the code is very complicated, the JIT will not make any sense out of it. Now this is the goal and we are not quite there yet, but most of the time it works. So I'm gonna show you the demo what happens if you if you however do please the JIT. No, I didn't go. Extra dog. So this is the image detection algorithm that was written in Python and uh, it just proce processes pictures and shows on on the end layer. This is for for a company that uh, does uh, strange camera operations so it'll, they will like have a smart cameras that count uh, customers going to the shop and the point of this is that this sort of operation is uh, on C Python, it will yield. Let me run it on C Python. And on Python, it runs about 24 frames per second. And on C Python, we are still waiting for the first frame. It's, it's, it runs like 0 0.01 frames per second or something like this. Oh, we got the first frame. Oh, 0 0.1 frames per second. So it takes 10 seconds to render a single frame. So wait and so this is an example of what happened what you can do right now if you please the G so this is what was written by the guy who first wrote the code and then went to the JIT and added optimizations to the JIT to make sure his code runs fast so this is a bit of a stretch I must agree H however the point is that you should be able to write absolutely normal code like that uh, and then hope for it to be fast and this is the area this is why you care because this is the area where you would normally write stuff in uh, in C or assembler typically and he doesn't want to he wants to write stuff where in Python because Python is more expressive because it takes time of uh, experimentation and you don't want to do that so this is why we care about Python being fast because there are people outside of core Python world so they don't serve web pages they do stuff that's actually computationally expensive and it's useful for them to use Python anyway so it's a it widens the area where Python can be potentially useful uh, instead of trying to speed up Python for existing people so we don't want just that we want to expand Python so other people can also use it and be happy with it outside of the core competence numerics numeric uh, is a good example so people in numeric community will use uh, what are we doing we are still trying to close and player people in the numeric community will try to use uh, no I want to talk about it. Uh, people in the numeric community will try to use Python but as soon as they try to express their algorithms in actually Python they end up being so slow that they are told to rewrite stuff in C and that's that's not what we want we want Python to be fast enough to not worry most of the time uh, I have quite a few more slides about like various details how calls look like how stuff like this works so I'll just show you the differences in calls. So I have few calls, and this is the this is the simplest possible call. So you just pass the parameters. This is slightly more complex call where you pass them by uh, by keyword arguments. This is a simple method call. A call where you create a tuple and pass it a star arc. A call where you create a dictionary and and pass them quite crazy. And this is a complete abomination where you pass just locals. People do that. I mean, I didn't invent that. <laughs> so, if you run this stuff on, for example, PyPy, if you run this on normal Python, 
mm, let's say oh, a bit more you get like about 600 CPU cycles per type of call if you however run the same thing on PyPy you get much wider distribution so I guess we have to pass more so the basic thing is really like three processor cycles that's very good that means that almost no code no code got compiled there and the uh, abomination is like still computing so it's probably about 2000 or 3000 cycles so uh, it really when you use PyPy it really depends what how complex your code is and it will distribute much wider we would love to have like this guy that takes thousand calls that's not that bad to actually take few few cycles instead of thousand cycles so we are but we are probably never gonna improve the abomination situation so write your code simple I guess I'll not talk about many details but the summary of that is we hope all this knowledge how exactly you call things how exactly you specify things is not needed but right now you can use this if you really need to write fast Python we hope this will be gone by now and we don't you don't need to worry but the, the problem is usually the more you care the better you need to know so if you care about your VM performance you probably actually need to know how cache lines work if you write Python chances are this is not that necessary or how exactly your branch prediction in the processor works by the way this is confidential data I couldn't learn it uh, so th the summary is that the more you the more you care about the performance the more you need to know about details of how your environment works in order to achieve what you what you need okay thank you very much are there any questions much thank you very much <laughs> i'm sure there will be questions questions I have a very small monitor. I, I actually claim I predate the UI trends by removing all the Windows decorations before uh, smartphones went out. Because <laughs> I have so little space. Other questions? LVH there. So, uh, great talk. And assuming that you do go through the trouble of like writing a benchmark, what are the tools to basically, uh, outside of the obvious, like, use a profiler? What are the tools for um, seeing this is the thing that PyPy really doesn't understand and I there probably should be a way of rewriting it so that it understands better? So right now, unfortunately, you need to use the JIT viewer, which, which is a bit bad, but you don't need to use it and, like, you don't need to understand all that, that's there. If you look at, for example, JIT viewer for calls, so just Google JIT Viewer, we hijacked the name. Uh, say so if I have JIT Viewer, Chrome, Chrome, Chrome. Uh, so you have like anything from doesn't look too bad because there are just few few instructions per Python bytecode to something like uh, this is simple call this is another simple call to something like this where you have like lots of instructions I think this one is oh this is abomination so then it starts with like allocating stuff and doing things so if you see there's lots of stuff then probably PyPy didn't understand it all that well and thinking, thinking, and munching stuff that um, absolutely not necessary. So, I'm actually I'm working on a more. So I'm working on a tool that will display you the density of those operations, for example. So you'll have like code coloring that shows you green versus red, whether the code was compiled nice or not so nice, but it's not done yet. So. I claim you need such tools, but they're not written, and I'm trying to write them, but it takes time, unfortunately, like software in general. 
More questions? Yeah. It's a comment that's actually pretty impressive that the abomination is no slower in PyPy than in normal Python. Not, not when you run a whole bunch of... Uh, was it? Yeah, it was twice as oh, slow, well, I think. That's not too bad either. <laughs> I, it's. I was surprised as well because it seems like it will force or like make it a board or something. Cool. I think that's it. Everybody. Much. I thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>